<clears throat> Gee, what, what do I got to do to get that kind of applause, huh, Steve? <laughs> <laughs> um, welcome, welcome, everyone. It is so great to be here. Um, Steve was telling me he actually drove in. I got in yesterday, and we're thrilled to be here. Reminds me of one of the horrible parts of technology, <laughs> <coughs> navigation systems. <laughs> navigation uh, systems. Well, eventually, trust them. you won't have to drive yourself, right? There'll be, there'll be a car yeah. driving you. Um, no, I wanted to jump right into it. Um, for those that don't know, I'm a reporter at CNBC. I'm based in San Francisco, and I cover technology. So I have to start off, Steve, by uh, really thanking you, because I cover. I'm, my job is to cover tech, and I'm thankful to you for the notion that anyone can or should own a computer. Without you, who knows what my, what my huh? job would be. <laughs> um, let's go back 40 years, um, that moment. Okay. And I, you know, I just checked the market cap of Apple this morning. I knew it was getting close to a trillion dollars. It's at eight hundred billion dollars. Did you ever imagine? No, this was been, where no, it would go? Neither, no, no, no. Neither one of us did. We thought we had a great product and we were good and we could possibly have a big company. Big is whatever you want to judge it. You know, when you're this didn't when you're exist. in your twenties. Oh my gosh, a million dollar company would be unheard of. But yeah, but we, we did thought we'd go somewhere. Did you say million dollar or billion dollar? A million. I said a million. Well, this is a long time ago. And we thought, and you know. But even near his death, Steve was calling me and said, did you ever, you know, imagine, you know, where it would go? So, and our ideas of what the industry would be like and how people would use computers on their own was so wrong that if we were right, this industry never would have happened. <laughs> Fortunately, we had a platform and other, all, all the millions of smart people out there, kind of open source-ish, could apply and develop new things like music keyboards, plug it into a computer and you know, and, and quality got better and better. So eventually it became important in our lives. Well, it was, it was from the beginning, it was just, you know, who needs a $2,000 typewriter? You know, who needs a $2,000 machine that will uh, uh, reconcile your checkbook if you can spend all the time to read in check, checks off of paper, off a of cassette tape? <laughs> I'm sure, and so what are some of the most surprising things now? Did you ever imagine computers being used the way, the way they are now? Um, the, well, the main thing is, well, the displays got more realistic to where you're looking at a display nowadays, and you may not be able to tell if it's fake, you know, with avatars, or is it real people. So the, the presentation quality, and that involved the speed of processors going up, it's all the Moore's Law stuff. The amount of storage and memory that we have on disk, we didn't even have a disk when we started the company, but the amount of storage that we can store is everything. When we started Apple, the, the amount of memory to hold a song, you think about computers do normal personal things nowadays, including holding music. The amount of memory that held a song cost close to a million dollars. <laughs> so do you think, <laughs> do you really envision, oh my gosh, someday there'll be movies on little cards and you'll have, you know, 50 movies on a little card. <laughs> or not even on the card anymore, right? Up in the cloud. Up in the cloud, so yeah. It's amazing how far I've come. Now, before we get to, you know, the current technological revolution we're seeing right now in artificial intelligence. I want to go back a little bit to what came after the PC, the smartphone. Mm -hmm. Did you see that coming? Well, there was an iPod in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, as a matter of fact, our company valuation, our company's valuation built upon the one PC we started with was all of our revenues for the first 10 years of Apple. And then the Macintosh took over from the Apple II and we were the same size, so we didn't grow. We didn't grow with a new computer that you could see into. We didn't grow with a new operating system, the iPod. We wrote our, our, our music program for Windows and Macintosh users so everyone in the world could buy our iPod. Sales doubled, profits doubled, board of directors gave Steve Jobs billions of dollars in <laughs> the jet airplanes. So, so that was in the way. Now the iPhone was kind of like the really great product that told us, oh my gosh, I've never had something so powerful. But it was really just a start. And the first iPod only had Apple's apps. No third party app store, no possibility of Ubers and Airbnbs and, and you know, airline reservations and restaurant reservations. No, none of that stuff that really changes how we live the most. What is about Apple though to anticipate what a customer wants before they know that they want it. I mean, before the iPod, there was MP3 players. Sony was, you know, there was the Walkman, the Discman. And before the iPhone, there was the Palm and, you know, Blackberry. And these were seen as good enough. But what is it about Apple that okay. was able to, you know, create a revolution? Yeah, first of all, Apple had a very strong following uh, based on a lot of things that happened from the start of the company on. A lot of uh, following among people who were, uh, I don't know, educators and that kind of people. And believe We were doing making computers easy compared to other people. So we had an advantage of a built-in audience that would look at our stuff. And the iPhone. I was on the board of directors of companies that made some of these prior smartphones. But the iPhone kind of came out and surprised everyone. The entire screen is a display. It's not full of little clicky buttons even to type. A whole methodology came about, and it said 
Your phone's not important because it can reach the internet. The internet is the most important thing. And this is a little internet device in your hand. But you know, it was still, it was still in early, early days for that. The iPhone did not even have 3G cellular connection, just 2G at first. So it took a while to get up to the sort of life we enjoy now. Oh my gosh, I can watch videos, I can share videos, pictures, all that stuff. It was still a little bit hard in the early days of the iPhone. But the iPhone changed our life. I get asked a lot, what changed your life the most of Apple's? And I used to say the iPhone, but now I say the third party app store. That's changed, has <laughs> little changed. A little bit of openness, let Leah, <laughs> let a lot of other people take it where they can. Build a platform. Okay, let's look forward a little bit now. The reason we're here, artificial intelligence. Now, you said, back in 1975 that you knew the moment the computer revolution started. I'm sorry, that was, you said it was 1975 at the Homebrew Computer Club. When is the moment, or what is the pivotal moment that you knew that AI started? Wow, um, you know, I've been following <coughs> AI and how does the computer uh, um, relate to a brain, software with steps telling it what to do, hardware that can do certain calculations. And all my life I grew up thinking a computer can't ever get near a brain, never will. And, um, and I'd go to, I'd ride my bicycle over to Stanf Stanford Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, SAIL. I'd ride, it was a long ride. And I'd go there and they had machines that could pick up a blue ball and put it in a blue box. And I thought, what, you're calling that intelligence? <laughs> and it's like, you know, it's like, kind of like they taught a computer to play tic-tac-toe. And I even built one when I was 10 years old. But you say, that's intelligence, it's just a set of rules. And then the computer could play checkers. You said, well, that's not a complicated enough game to be like a brain. And then computers could play chess. So they kind of, every time they got higher and higher, we still said, it's not intelligence, we knew there was a difference. And I got a little bit scared during the, um, uh, the days of uh, Singularity, the book that came out from Ray Kurzweil, and I started thinking, well, at first I said, no, it's totally wrong. A computer doesn't work the way a brain does. It's not intuitive. It can do things very, very fast, but it can't think of new ideas. And then Ray Kurzweil's method of predicting a singularity was based on exponential curves of amount of data and how much it would process, equaling the brain by a certain year. And I said, that is the right way to predict things. On exponential curves, like Moore's Law, you don't see a change, you don't see a change, ask, ask Nokia, ask Blackberry. You don't see a change, and then all of a sudden it happens. It's sort, <laughs> of, it's sort of there. So I thought, oh my gosh, what if, you know, machines along 200 years ago in Manchester, England, the machines won the war. They learned how to make cheap clothing. So then you'll fire the humans, but never the machine that makes your cheap clothing. And so the machines won the war on that level, but the physical work, assembling cars is obviously, um, you know, undergone a huge transition in our lifetime, but that was physical work. And now machines are starting to get up, replacing more and more mental work. I want answers, even if it's just calculating, you know, 87 plus 32. I mean, uh, I used to do it in my head, but now, <laughs> now I'll just ask Siri. So machines got more and more uh, like human intelligence. And I remember Apple had a, a, the Newton message pad. You could handwrite with your own human muscles. The day I got it, San Francisco airport with my kids, I opened it up and I found out I could write on a notepad a word with, I could handwrite it and the machine knew what the word was. Cool. And then I, wrote, I got a phone call and I wrote a message. Sarah, that's my daughter, Sarah, dentist, Tuesday, 2 p.m. so I could look at it later and remind myself, put it on the calendar. And I saw a button called assist and I clicked the assist button, not knowing what it would do, it opened up the calendar. Tuesday at 2 p.m. it put the word dentist and it grabbed Sarah out of my contact list, and I was stunned. That changed my life forever. I said, this machine, I wrote something a human for a human, and a machine understood me. For the rest of my life, I want to live as much as I can in the human world. So if I wanted to phone a friend of mine, I would handwrite, call Jim, and I'd push assist and go beep, 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 and I didn't have to reach over to a phone and do the structure, you know, three, five, three, four, seven, four, seven. The machine did it for me. I loved being in that, I just live in a human world. I don't have to think about how to operate machines. I don't have to memorize instructions. And then we got Siri. Well, Siri was an app on the iPhone for a year before Apple had it. And I was all over saying Siri is so great. I'm starting to think, it's like a friend, it's like a human. Oh my gosh, if thinking is getting closer to the way humans really think, what happens if it gets hits economics? What, you know, you look at your big financial trades and 80% of them, computer to computer in milliseconds. If you put a slow human in the middle, you lose money. So what if you have a company and you skip the CEO and it makes more money? 
So when, when did this notion start? <laughs> A great topic for this crowd here. <laughs> When did this notion, you're talking about being amazed by it and seeing Syria come on the scene, but when did it start to scare you? And I think that's well, that what you're Well, that was when it started to, to scare me. That's when it started to scare me. But and why, I started why to exactly was I it I started scary? to speak about it two years before Stephen yeah. Hawking and Elon Musk because you can't predict what's beyond the singularity. And then I, I, I reversed myself, totally backtracked. I thought like an engineer, what are the steps that would have to be in place to allow machines to really replace humans in this world? And it's so much, it's so many decades or, or centuries away that, um, that I really gave up on it being realistic. All the machines we're building are just gonna help us live a nice life like the family dog. <laughs> so there's no notion. <laughs> so feed your dog filet steaks because do unto others the way you wanna be treated. <laughs> But that idea what you just brought up is replacing jobs. Um, maybe you don't need to be scared of AI right now, but what about factory workers? What about some other people you in our society? Always, should, should others be worried? You can always find an example of a job that got replaced by something all through history, starting in Manchester, England, building the cheap clothing. Like I said, the humans would get, could get fired, but not the machine. Well, do we have a lack of jobs? We really, really, the jobs, they tend to shift maybe their social category of what jobs are needed. But um, this whole idea has been around for hundreds of years of, oh my gosh, some new technology is gonna replace jobs and interfere with human productivity, and I just don't buy it. So I, the jobs are gonna change, they're that's not gonna a scare, be eliminated. It's a scare story, it's a scare story. No, we live, yeah, we live along with it, and we, we do. We have to run the machines, and here's why. We haven't talked about a single artificial intelligence machine that ever sat down and said, what should I do? Hmm, what would be a method to solve this problem? What is a good problem to solve? What would be fun? We just, that just, we're so far from that. But isn't that exactly what we're trying to do right now? The big tech companies trying to get them to think on their own. I think just recently um, Google is yeah. using YouTube videos to teach computers. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're 200 years after the science fiction writers and we're just, and we're just trying to uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> make the artificial, the artificial human. And, but there's so many steps. You would have to have, for machines, this apocalypse idea, machines will take over from humans. They'd have to be thinking out all the directions of where to go in the world for themselves, like her, maybe. They like machines, they don't like people. Eventually, could that happen? They would, every single physical step from digging ores out of the ground, every bit of machinery, they would have to totally control and have no humans. Too many things to change. The infrastructure of the world is too huge, so it's not gonna happen soon. So I, I don't really um, buy into the, the fear tactic of um, artificial intelligence, oh my gosh, nobody's gonna have a job anymore. That's just, that's not the way to think. We should be productive and think, how can I be constructive? What can I do that's valuable and help humans do more? And one thing is, um, we don't wanna be in a conflict with machines ever, where they have a decision to make. I mean, we're talking about, of course, you know, automatic weapons, that's a problem. But they have a decision to make, and uh, should, I, should I help humans or not? Psychologists said that our tendency to have wars, our conflict tendency as humans, comes a lot from our own mortality. And, and um, you know, it's kind of like every battle you get into with somebody, it's kind of like my life or their life. It's a conflict, that's how we look at the world. And if those machines ever looked at it that way, they might wanna say, oh my gosh, humans are our enemy, we have to fight them somehow. So I don't want that. Isaac Asimov had the, the law of robotics deeply embedded, you couldn't, the, the robot couldn't think its way out of it. You, a robot will never harm a human being. Well, if we ever have robots that think just like humans, my law, Waz's law, is a human being should never harm a robot. They should not think we can kill them, unplug them, erase their memories. They shouldn't think of us that way. They should only be our best friends that are gonna um, do everything they can to help us. So you're saying as long as we treat robots right, they'll treat us right? Yeah, it, won't, <laughs> it probably won't work that way because the robots will get into <laughs> arguing with themselves if that ever happens. But <laughs> That's a scary thought. Um, aren't we talking already um, in this day and age about robots making decisions for us? So when we talk about autonomous driving, um, not in the not too distant future, we're talking about cars that are gonna be able to choose <coughs> whether choosing a family's life or one person's life, making those kinds of decisions, is that a scary thought? That decision's not scary at all. Do you trust them? 
uh, decisions, not, not scared off, if there was real artificial intelligence instead of AI being augmented idiocy or something, then the cars, the cars would only protect themselves, not even any humans. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but if they got to that level, you know, where they're really kind of thinking like they have a consciousness. They're, but they're choosing life or death in that scenario. But that's fine, that's fine. You know, you buy a car, you're gonna, if you're in a car, you're probably usually gonna make the decision to protect yourself over others, um, that's just, so I, I don't think, but that's a worthless question to ask because that, that, that's in current life with that's what, that's what autonomous driving is looking at right now though, isn't it? No, no, that's just a question that people are pulling popping up, it's a philosophical question. Yeah, do I kill the one over here? Do I kill the six over here? And the one is, is younger, do I, hit, do I hit the raccoon that's walking in front of me? So that's, that's too far off in the future, right now, is what no, you're well, saying. Well, those decisions just aren't important because we live with them as humans already. Okay. And, uh, and you know, do you ever think about, what am I gonna do if I see a situation like that? Nobody even bothers to think it out. It's too worthless a concept, but it, it, it's kind of fun. It's fun to write about. Yeah, how will the cars decide? Um, no, I think that, that in the end, the, the idea is the cars will be safer because we make so many mistakes, but I'm not sure that's actually how it's turning out yet. What do you mean by that? It's not that the cars are going to make... I think, that, uh, I think the cars are, are probably, for example, the Tesla with assisted driving facilities, I think is less safe, and they hide the actual statistics. It's real easy to do. How do they do that, and why? what, what makes you believe that? that? Oh, what were the real cases behind accidents? What are the real numbers? You just don't get it. So it's, you, it's very tightly hidden, and, um, and they kind of claim, oh, three times fewer accidents um, you know, when you're not using autopilot. Well, wait a minute. If you're using autopilot and you see something coming up, what do you, the first thing you do is you hit the brake, and then the autopilot's not on during the accident. That's kind of, it's kind of like, how do you twist words around? Sort of that political thing. So um, I don't buy it. I mean, I see too many danger, danger situations, you know, in my own, my own Tesla, for example. Um, you it, dri anything, so you drive a Tesla. It can handle something that's perfectly normal. Now you get to some road construction, some cones in the middle. There's not a way. It doesn't even know what's going on. All the times it tries to jerk you off to an exit you're not planning to take. Or <laughs> lanes come and merging in. It starts, it starts driving like it's drunk. And... and, <laughs> and the, these are the I, but the funny thing is, every single human being handles those things fine. And that's the, interesting. I think, and it, the car. Not only that, the navigation system I talked about is so horrible. These self-driving cars are going to have to rely on navigation systems based on GPS. Just getting here to Las Vegas, driving here. My gosh, there's times you it thinks you're supposed to go on a road that doesn't exist anymore, but the yeah, freeway's newer. And I, I know you said that you're not afraid of AI anymore, but you're personally making me a little bit afraid of it. <laughs> Anyone else? Well, that's not AI though. That, but okay, that's not AI. Okay, tell me the difference then. What the difference between that should, you know, automation AI? be used in in driving? Then it sounds to me like you're not a huge fan of automating the driving process more, or um, what Tesla's doing. I think we're going to be a long ways to getting to um, to level. Five. I mean, Audi shows off some cars that are level four. Level five is, it just totally thinks for itself. Level four is, it kind of thinks for itself, but if it can't handle it, it just stops. At least it's safe. Um, Tesla's kind of down at level two. And um, artificial intelligence is the mistaken phrase. It's not intelligence. It's still a bunch of set of rules called simulated intelligence. We make you think that a car is doing some smart things that you do with your brain, but it's not really thinking for itself yet. That's, that's a ways off, and when it does, will it be able to handle the real world the way humans do? And I'd like to see it shown, demonstrated first. So then yes or no, should this kind of technology be used in cars, in a world where we have self-driving cars? Is that a good or bad thing? Yes, I'm sorry, don't misunderstand me. The technology should be developed and used because we're driven to make changes in the world. And sometimes when you make a change, there's negatives that go along with the positives, right? From our own computers and, and personal smartphones, you can look at, a lot of people like to look at negatives. I just look at the positives. For example, Steve Jobs and I, when we started the company, we said, what do we want to do? We want to make blind people more equivalent to sighted people. That was our goal. And we succeeded because everywhere you go, you see people walking along, staring at their phones, and they're blind. <laughs> But my point is, there might be negatives to what you do, but we as human beings are born with this desire. I want to change things. Things will somehow get better. We will get a happier life. Are we happier than people were 10,000 years ago? I mean, I doubt it. I don't have any reason to really think we are because the species survived. So we don't really ever seem to reach that happiness, but that's our goal, and we're driven. Invent new things, make the world different, be in control of things. So we can't, you can't stop that. It's not like, oh my gosh, here's the danger that might come from artificial intelligence. How are you ever gonna stop it from happening? 
I no, think... you're just standing in the front of a steamroller and you're going to get run over. <laughs> Again, I'm not sure that you're convincing me that it's all going it's, it's to be rosy in the future. Um, that well, we shouldn't not, be I'm afraid of these to. machines. That we shouldn't be afraid yeah. of these machines. I guess what you're talking about, too, is this idea of let artificial contribute versus control. Would that be right? There was a survey that came out and asked people, um, what do you want AI to do for you in the future? At the top of the list were things like save money and time. At the bottom of the list were things like take care of my parents, take care of my children, be my friend. I'm in total agreement with everything you say. We, we developed all these things, including artificial intelligence, the, what we call intelligence, not like a brain. But um, we develop it all to make things life nice for us humans, make things better, to give us things we want. Let us do more. Let us be more Superman. When I'm, when I'm with a phone, a, a smartphone, I have more power than any superpower in, in the cartoons. <laughs> um. Let's go back to some of these pivotal moments in artificial intelligence. One that is talked about quite a bit is when Watson went on to Jeopardy. IBM created this machine and it beat, you know, a championship Jeopardy player. Um, looking back now that we're some years on from that, how pivotal was that moment? Have, has artificial intelligence and Watson lived up to that promise? Watson was a big step because I went through handwriting, being human thoughts being recognized, and then I got to, I just want to speak, you know, call, call Janet, honk the horns of the car, I just want to be a human being. And then Watson came along, kind of had the equivalent of conversations, but it was very tightly trained for that exercise, and it's just basically a great supercomputer. That made me think more and more, these machines are becoming like humans. I mean, we talk to them and treat them like, like human friends. Would they ever be that good of a friend that they could even let every student go in different directions in life? rather than have one teacher and 30 students, because um, I'm education-oriented too. So, uh, so, no, I'm, I'm, uh, so I, th I think that uh, this is, but it doesn't scare me. Oh my gosh, now a machine could think better than me? There's an awful lot of things we don't do with our brains anymore. We have to memorize, we used to have to memorize every little detail of the world, you know, from, from the, the capital of every state and the countries and the history. And now you kind of, with Google, you kind of don't have to. I mean, with, with search it, engines. Why did it take so long, though, from that Jeopardy moment, which I believe was more than 10 years ago now, to what we're seeing now with all of these virtual assistants and Google Maps and all things that you're talking about? So, and it hasn't lived up to that promise. I think people were very, very excited about it. The Watson, mainstream in Watson that moment. Watson was acting like you right here. You're at, what if you were a metal form inside and you're just, and you're having this kind of a conversation? Whoa, you know, that's very, that's very, I'm sorry, I can't tell it's not a human. There's nothing I can touch on. Um, we've both had human lives, and Watson didn't. Watson wouldn't understand some aspects of music and feelings, you know, nice breeze on a beach. Just wouldn't understand those things. Maybe someday we'll have robots that really live a life like humans. But it's, it's, a, it's, it's a very different world. So, um, so Watson was, was a, a step that had a meaning to us. Oh, my God. These machines will sit there and be able to answer the question. They'll be able to, what is the marketing strategy for the company? And they'll whip it out. And why do we hire a, a, you know, a VP of marketing? Um, that's sort of the fear that people got. And I just, I'm saying I've come around just as an engineer thinking out what little steps have to be done one at a time. We, had to, we have to tell Watson almost exactly what to do. A machine that beats Go. We have to say, here is a method to play 80,000 or 800,000 Go games and you'll figure it out. Um, that's not how the brain works, because the thing I saw the other day, a person's young child sees a dog and gets told it's a dog, a three-year-old, a two-year-old, and knows what dogs are from then on. They don't have to see 80,000 pictures of dogs to identify them. Exactly. So are we getting closer to how the brain really works is, is the issue, and I don't think we're, and we're, we're far from it. You think, we're, but that's exactly what Google's trying to do right now is show pictures instead of saying that's a dog. You're right, it's taking you know, 80,000, however many images. It's but the state of the art of the science and it's very helpful to us. Very helpful to us. It can spot things we can't spot in the end. Okay, let's talk about the Internet of Things and wearables. Um, how is artificial intelligence going to change our lives in this sense? And do you think that, you know, of course, Apple has the watch. Um, is this changing the way we view artificial intelligence and use it in our everyday Yeah, I don't lives. like the phrase artificial intelligence because I claim it's not intelligent, it doesn't work the way a brain does, so it always throws me off a little. Um, I love, I love the def certain devices in my life. The trouble is you could buy Internet of Things, you could buy 100 different devices and try them out, and the locks on your door and the, the garage doors, and generally you try things out, technology out, until it fails for you and it gives you uh, headaches and problems. Come on, I just want a light switch on the wall that turns on this light. Sometimes it is your resort. So yes, there's yes and no's. Now, I love, I love, I love technology. I love my uh, Bolt EV electric vehicle because it's a $35,000 electric car. I love that. I love my Apple Watch so much. And I love my Apple Watch because normal things that I do in life 
have become easier. I do not have to pull a cell phone out and click some apps and know what to do and unlock it. I don't have to go through any of those steps. I just pick up the watch and I tell it to send my wife a quick email that I'm walking the dogs or, or a quick text message. I can, I can get you know, disruptions all, the, all day long. Oh, you call them notifications. And I can clear them instantly and clear wrong phone numbers without having to do anything. I can, um, I can also Apple Pay. It's just the greatest way to pay. To pay, I forget, I was somewhere, uh, somewhere last night, I did Apple Pay and it was just, just so easy. It's very it's, convenient. You don't even pull the phone out anymore. Now, Android, for example, a Apple's been the company that always worked on making life easy for humans. Watch Apple always for the direction. But um, there were phones in the Android world that did tap your phone and you could pay with it. Two years before Apple had Apple Pay. Two years. And I, you had to buy a certain phone. And I like to experiment. So I bought the right phones and I went in and I set it up. So I'd go into a Walgreens and here's what I'd do. Or a 7-Eleven. I would um, turn on my phone, Android phone. I'd have to type an unlock code. I'd have to find an app like Google Wallet. And then I'd have to select a credit card and type in the PIN number for that credit card. And then I could pay. Do you see, you see the problem with that? A credit card is so much easier. And then Apple came out, you don't even turn your phone off. I'm really you glad just you're- hold your phone out, put your finger on it to identify yourself, <laughs> and it pays. <coughs> Will we be doing that with our faces soon? Speaking of, you know, this convenience and, you know, the iPhone 10 is about to be released. Uh, is that somewhere that you think Apple I, Pay is going? I don't like to, well, obviously that's where Apple Pay is going because they don't have any fingerprint detection. Your face is going to be equivalent to it. Um, but I don't like to comment on does it work or doesn't it work just because I'm from Apple. I like to get it in my hand, use it, and tell you what the results are. So, so, I'm, so I'm holding out on commenting on whether I'll like that better than, than the finger or the watch is the best but you, of all. But you like the convenience of just using your fingerprint to pay, not pulling out your wallet or going through you know, a few different steps. And, now, and I even want the convenience of doing everything everywhere. I want to take this watch, open up my house door, open up my car doors, open up my business door, pay for me everywhere. A ring, a little ring would be even better. Maybe we'll have that. <laughs> Will we ever have a worldwide standard in that area? Visa so, is now. Luck. Visa and MasterCard, I believe, both have the ring where you just tap. The only worldwide standard we have in technology is Wi-Fi. Everywhere you go in the world, it works. I'm, I'm glad we're getting into the payment space of this because we are at Money 2020. And I think one of the big themes in particular that we're looking at as media this year is we, our big banks really the biggest, uh, sorry, big tech companies like Apple, Google, Facebook, are they the biggest threat to banks? Um, you just had a great example of how Apple is taking the friction out of that process. The payment process though, still has so many different layers. There was an Accenture study at the beginning of this year that said one in three consumers would trust a big tech company like Apple or Facebook uh, for their financial services versus a bank. Are we going to see eventually an Apple or Facebook turn into Bank of Apple or FaceBank? I, I haven't looked at it that much. Some banking functions are obviously being taken over by our smartphones, you know, um, payment system, but look at Apple. They just go through standard credit card companies for payment. They hide a lot of things to keep you, they're the only company that really gives you secrecy. Google makes all its money off of knowing everything you do and everything you buy. Apple makes it off of good products. So I, so I like Apple in this case, <laughs> but, but no becoming bias. a bank, becoming a bank is a huge issue of assets and following a whole set of banking laws that have been set up for banks for a long time. And do they allow enough room for real creative, you know, where can you slip in? And I just see um, uh, Apple Pay, for example, slipping in right so far as just in a conjunction with your banks, just making the process easier. So you think they'll work together? I think, I think they'll work together. They'll work I mean, together that, in the yeah. future. What I've seen, Even I mean, as Apple moves further and further into this. A space. Apple's a very huge company and could decide, oh, we want to really take over the banking functions because we want to be real vertical, that sort of thinking. Um, and, and I don't know if I would like that. Why wouldn't you like that? I like more diversity. Right. In, in all, yeah, yeah, but but you said you, you don't like the friction. You want it to be the smoothest, easiest place possible. If that made it easier, would you like that? If that made it easier? And more conven your life more convenient if it saved you time and money. Probably, but you know what? Our, our digital technology and our smartphone technology has already made banking an awful lot easier regardless. So it's, you don't have to even physically you know, go into the bank much anymore. Yeah, but I mean, you still think of some functions, like how long it takes you if you want to send money to London today. It's going to take you a few days to do that. Doesn't it seem like there's still so much, um, so much to be done in this space? 
there, there are nice, easy ways to do it. And there's Bitcoin, too. So don't, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about Bitcoin. OK. Thoughts? You, can, you start Thought, us off. Bitcoin? Well, I, I admired well, cryptocurrencies in general. I admired it when it was first presented. I looked at it as a form of currency and didn't understand the blockchain technology as much, you know, and now I do. But the Bitcoin was, you know, I remember trying to buy it. Oh, you had to have a bank account at one certain bank and do things by faxes. It was so awkward. It kept me from getting early Bitcoin. By the time I got my Bitcoin, then it dropped to half. And then I don't, I, I'm not financial. I've never used Apple's stock app one time. I don't like to look at bank accounts, see what I have. Other people can do it for me. But um, so I don't, I didn't follow the price of Bitcoin even. It was, I, mean, I like the technology because it's based on mathematics. And I'm a mathematician, my wife and I, we judge a hotel room more by the number on the door than what's inside the room. <laughs> We're both mathematicians. And, what's and a good number? A good number would be 1625 65. because it's four squared, five squared. Anything with mathematical patterns. <laughs> That's amazing. And, and relevance, you know, we do, we, do this, we do this everywhere. We actually get happy when we have a good room. So, so Bitcoin is mathematical. There is a certain finite amount of Bitcoin that can ever exist. And that's not like you can just create as many more dollars, US dollars. That's a phony. So a US dollar is kind of phony in a sense. And Bitcoin's genuine and real in, in that sense. And uh, the, the fact the blockchain is such a distributed method, there isn't one bank that holds the information. So for example, if you had blockchain applied to music, Every little source of putting contributions into a song, every little person all that micro would micro, you know, get their payments and all through Bitcoin, the blockchain technology, not through Bitcoin. Um, right now, there's um, conflict minerals in the world, and you don't want to buy conflict minerals. Well, how do you avoid it? A company buys some gold from this country and gold from that country and smelts them together, and you never know in the final product. There's, but they're applying the blockchain technology to where all the payments can only go to the good, legitimate sources that don't have conflict minerals. I mean, so many, there's so many applications of blockchain popping up that are so different than you ever thought of. Um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to astound you in the world because you can't see what doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. When it doesn't exist, you can't really look forward very easily. It has to come into society and then get used to it. So I'm a big fan of, of the blockchain technology where the status of every transaction that's ever been made is kind of held all over the internet by a lot of different, in a lot of different places. And it's, um, it's more invulnerable, you would think of that way. So then going back the, to- The trouble is Bitcoin right now, they have the, you put your Bitcoin holdings into a bank, an account, and then some fraudulent guy comes along and steals it. That's been known, to, been known to happen. I've been hit on that one. It has some, some issues, some volatility as well. Does that mean it's here to stay, though? Will we have cryptocurrencies 20 years from now? Um, we, well, we have a cryptocurrency called Bitcoin. <clears throat> some of you might have heard of Ethereum, and you might treat it as a cryptocurrency. You could, but Ethereum's really a platform to apply blockchain to a lot of other technology. It's a platform like our early computers. Here's a computer. Write your own programs for it. You can have tens of thousands of programs we didn't even think of. So, so there's, there's a lot more to this cryptocurrency than just, you know. Just the Bitcoin, but will value. there, will there Russia, be one? Russia has, what, the crypto ruble they're going to have. I mean, so there's, there's and huge we have companies and there's huge forces in the world, including countries, that are trying to say the same thing like, oh, by a certain year, we'll only have electric cars. We're going to switch to cryptocurrency. There are real strong advantages in it that are, that are good for the users. Is it ever going to be like gold or the dollar? Is it going to be an accepted, you know, even a reserve is currency sometime? Bitcoin ever going to be like gold or the dollar? Well, I explained one reason it's not like the dollar. You don't know how many dollars exist in the world and it can change very easily um, for political reasons. Uh, gold can keep getting mined. Gold gets mined and mined and mined. I guess maybe there's a finite amount of gold in the world, but Bitcoin is even more mathematical and regulated and nobody can change the mathematics. We might find a way to make gold or get, just dig more out of the earth, right. find more deposits. Um, so even gold isn't quite as stable, but it's like gold, you know? You have gold and it's solid and it holds its value. It is worth gold. It's kind of like you have a house, right? And your house has a value. And if it's a house today, 40 years from now, it's a house. It still is a house in value. Wait a minute, oh my gosh, it went up from, from $20,000 to two million. I'm, I, I made a ton of money. No, you still have one house. The government says you made a ton of money so they can tax half of it. <laughs> well, they tax all of it and get all half right. of it. Um, now, I just want to make sure we have enough time uh, because I do want to get to make sure I have a few questions. Um, we have four minutes left. We, 
Do we? Do you know? Are <laughs> well, you seeing? Well, as, as long I'll go as long as we have. Okay, to. I, I assume they'll cut us off then. I do want to try and get to a few Q and A questions as well. Um, a question though, General. What do you think of today's engineers, especially since you came up in the 70s, created the personal computer? Um, how do you view them? And first, I'll have a follow-up after that. When I was young, I felt engineering was hard work, and I was so skilled at it, learning all the mathematics, how to combine parts, minerals from the, minerals from the Earth, and knowing how they would treat electrons. You could use differential calculus and design circuits that made televisions and things. Engineering was really hard. You had to be a brainiac in math to be an engineer. And I thought engineers were the most valuable, important people in the world to make new things that actually work. Nowadays, engineering includes digital engineering. And I found out even when I was 10 years old, I, just, I stumbled into it. No books in bookstores, nothing about it. You'd have to actually stumble on a manual made for older engineers. And I learned this digital world doesn't use any math. You don't need any high level math at all. By nine years old, you've got all the math you'll ever need to design every bit of digital logic in an iPhone, except not the radios. The radios still are the, in the analog world and need that difficult mathematics stuff. And programming doesn't need any math. It just needs a mind that can put together long, long projects and sequences, keep them right and think them out and fix them and, and doesn't mind getting, uh, going crazy at night. So, so that's a different kind of engineering. You know, they call two types of engineering, analog engineering, heavy mathematics, digital engineering is just a process. And I don't know why they call them both engineering. What advice would you have then to today's engineers? To today's engineers? Um, one thing is look into, well, artificial intelligence, ca the categories that are gonna grow. Artificial intelligence, machine learning, how to make things smart, how language can be understood. We're gonna have breakthroughs there yet. And also look into, uh, I often say robotics and materials handling. Everything from robots that manufacture things to transporting things on rails through a factory, transporting them in, even in trucks. We're talking about self-driving, where self-driving trucks are gonna be before people have it, I think. Um, getting the, material, the, the materials to where they need to be, transferring them to other little robots that take them where you need. We've got hospitals that deliver medicines that way with robots down the halls. I think that that materials handling is a really good thing I would suggest to somebody if you want to have something viable when you get done. But you know what? More than anything else, don't listen to me and don't go where the world want, wants people. Go where it's in your heart. And you, <coughs> if you love something, you want to do it, some discipline, that's, the, that's what you should follow. <coughs> Um, now, I, th I believe we only have a few minutes left, so I wanted to do a quick, you know, lightning round with you. <laughs> I, <laughs> Get your opinion on a few I things worry. That, I, I'm on the spot. that are hopefully interesting for the audience. It'll be easy, I promise, okay? So we can just go through them fairly quickly, starting with number one, what smartphone do you use, what model? iPhone, but of course I carry and try a lot of the hottest phones that have come out in the world. So I have Android phones too, and I have different models of iPhones, and I also carry them on five different carriers in the United States <laughs> to compare. Well, how do you, you know what? I don't like to read stuff. I like to actually use it and see how it works. And then I have a feeling that's strong and I talk about it. So I use five carriers. How does anyone get a hold of you? How do they know what number to call? One, one main number has been my number actually since the very, very start of, but the start of cell phone time, except that I got a number 888888 and I couldn't use it because you could dial seven digit numbers in those days and every little baby, one third of the babies born in San Jose would call me. 100 calls a day. So I used 888889, that's close. It's close. Um, and I, and so, what's, so what's your primary phone then? What, my which primary, phone, what an, number? My, it's an iPhone, the latest. I always get the latest one. and I'm sort of debating that. I may not even get the iPhone 10 at first. It may be the first time I waited it out because my interest goes more into smart uh, electric cars, electric vehicles, and smart driving cars more than it goes into the latest uh, hot phones these days. Um, but I have an iPhone 8, and that's my main one, okay. and it fits in my pockets well. I have an 8 Plus, but it's a larger size do you, phone. Do you I have a Pixel? It. Do I have, I have a, a Pixel, pixel and a Pixel 2. Okay. I have a Pixel and a Pixel 2, just got the Pixel 2, and uh, debating it because I really love the shape, the size, the feel, the color of my Pixel. Sometimes those things matter. Like I have one phone number, one vanity number in my life, and by the way, it did get stolen once. Luckily, I got it back, but it's Hawaii, 808, and then it's 888888. <laughs> I, it's the only number I did that I went out and I worked for a month to get that number, and I call it Aloha Taxi. 808, Aloha Taxi. And uh, I had to put it on a yellow iPhone 5C, because taxi. Okay, 
Steve, I love the stories. I can tell we're almost out of time, and it's a lightning round. So I'm going to ask the, re the rest ones in quick, quick succession or preference, desktop or laptop? Laptop. Best AI character in a movie or book? That could be Hal, C-3PO, Wally. <sighs> Uh, Stumped him. Um, God, Chappie. Chappie? Maybe. Chappie? Maybe Chappie. <laughs> I think we're going to go way back. Okay. Well, we have, well, we have some, he turned out so good in the end. Um, <laughs> yeah, Hal was kind some, of evil. And, I, and we have some bad ones, yeah, like X okay. Machine and all that. Siri or Alexa? <coughs> Siri or what? Or Alexa. <sighs> I wish you hadn't asked that. Um, there, I think they're two different things, but I'm going to say Alexa. Really? Alexa, because I, I, you know, laying in bed, right, I'd okay. rather talk to Alexa, even though Siri might do a little more. Okay, um, Alexa or Cortana? Alexa, Alexa. Okay. Versus Cortana. Alexa or Google Assistant? <coughs> That's a real tough one. I wish you hadn't asked it. Either one. <laughs> Either one. They both, they both have, they both help me in different ways. I guess both of those over Siri. That's interesting. Different times, different times of the day. But at home, Alexa. Okay, um, at home, Alexa, Marvel or DC? I will never answer that question ever. I get, <laughs> I put on, I put on Silicon Valley Comic Cons, got to know Stan Lee very closely, and I just will not take a side because they're all, all those superheroes, <clears throat> they're all fascinating, they're all what we want to be, and the, but we're more with our smartphones but I'm anyway. I'm sure a lot of people want to know the answer to that And Stan question. Lee says the greatest superpower of all is luck. Okay. Bullet misses you. Okay, so you're declining to answer that one, Marvel or DC. Okay. Um, best Batman? Uh, best Batman, I'm not qualified to answer that one. Really? I refuse. Oh. Yeah. Okay. I, would, I kind of know the first one. Okay, you got to answer this next one, okay? Best prank that you've ever pulled? I never can have an answer for best prank because I pulled 100 that are so good. My next book is going to be a prank book, and you will not believe a lot of the ones I pulled. Um, can you give us one, maybe involving Steve Jobs? Oh, one involving Steve Jobs? Uh, well, Steve and I used to play pranks, and we, I'd play them on him. One night, we were kind of at midnight playing around with these little blue boxes that could make free calls anywhere in the world, and we're at the two pay phones at the, outside the cafeteria at our high school. And I put in a little button that you could kick, and you'd get a dial tone on both pay phones. It was really clever. And then, but Steve was on some calls with his blue box talking to friends. I never called my friends. I tried to talk to operators and see where I could extend lines around the world. So I just did an emergency interrupt into his phone number from, <laughs> from Alex Bell, what was the name of the chief special agent of the phone company in San Jose. And Steve hung up the phone quick. We have to run, they're here. I just smiled. <laughs> well, he got, he got really scared fast. <laughs> um, my last one, a worst prank? Any prank that backfired that you could share? Um, no pranks ever that backfired that I can remember. Don't remember getting caught. I felt sometimes after a prank, I felt like, oh, that was kind of dumb, but I really never got caught. Okay. I was so good. I only got caught once, and that was in high school when I put an electronic metronome in a friend's locker going tick, tick, tick. <laughs> <laughs> but, and the, the principal described pulling it out and clutching it to his chest and running to the football field to dismantle it. And I, a young kid, I, I started laughing because I had a switch that when you opened the locker, it sped up the ticking. <laughs> Goodness. Always try to do one thing more than other people would think. <laughs> Something tells me today that might, be a, that might turn out to be not so great prank. Steve, thank you so much. We learned so much. We really appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah.